fine. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, just a few housekeeping matters I'd like to cover before we get started. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this program is being recorded. We will distribute the link to the recording once it's been uploaded. Um, we ask that you please stay muted throughout the presentation. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of today's program. Uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and place them in the chat and I'll be monitoring those and we'll visit all of your questions at the end of the program. I'm Andrea Huntington, Executive Director of Indiana Land Protection Alliance, also known as ILPA. ILPA is a vibrant nonpartisan network of land trust, conservation partners, and community members. Our alliance champions land and water protection for all of Indiana. It is my very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Diane Hunter. Diane is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and a citizen of the tribe. Diane was uh, born in Indianapolis and raised in Wabash County. She has a bachelor's degree from Indiana University and master's degrees from Ball State University and Georgetown University. Diane came to work for the tribe in 2015 when the tribe opened a cultural resources extension office in Fort Wayne, Indiana. During her tenure, Diane has led a number of projects, including a blog to commemorate the 175th anniversary of the Miami forest removal from Indiana in 1846. I'm going to be including, um, just here in a few minutes, a link to the chat where you can access her blog online. Diane, we are so grateful and excited to have you with us today. And um, again, if you have not uh, gone ahead and muted yourself, please uh, do so. Although I think I have everyone muted now, um, but please just remain muted throughout. And if you have questions, uh, please feel free to include those in the chat. But Diane, thank you so, so much for being here with us. Hi. I just introduced myself to you in Miami Ata Wenge, the Miami language. I said pretty much what Andrea said about me. Um, my name is Diane Hunter. I am a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. And I am a descendant of Sekakweta and Palanzwa, who are also known as the Godfroys. And I am honored to serve my nation as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. What I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is talk about the history of Miami people. And I realize that my title says in Ohio, this is not about in Ohio, I apparently forgot to change that piece of, <laughs> of my slide. Um, I'm talking beyond um, Ohio. I'm talking about our history in what is now Indiana and Ohio and Illinois and, and beyond that area. But I also want to talk about the Miami tribe of Oklahoma today and about my role as tribal historic preservation officer. So I always like to begin at the beginning. Mitame. At first, the Miami came out of the water. Well, that's the first line of our oldest story. It's the story of our emergence as Miami people. We don't know where we were before we came out of the water. We believe that we were somewhere in what is today Canada, based on some of our other stories. Um, but we don't know exactly where we were and we don't know who we came from. But when we came out of the water, we were a unique and different people who came to be called Miamiake or Miami people. Now the place we came out of the water, we called Sakiweonge. And you can see here is Sakiweonge. I hope you can orient yourselves to this map. You recognize Lake Michigan um, and, and uh, the Ohio River down here, Mississippi River over here, 
But this is what we considered Miamiange, the land of the Miami. And the place where we came out of the water was the St. Joseph's River. Now, if you're from northeastern Indiana, you think that the St. Joseph's River goes through Fort Wayne. Well, it's not that St. Joseph's. It's the St. Joseph River that um, the city of South Bend today is in the South Bend of the St. Joseph River. So somewhere between South Bend, Indiana and Lake Michigan was once Sakiwayonge, the place of our origin. And we lived in this area since time immemorial. We don't know exactly how long, um, at least a thousand years, probably longer than that. And after a while, we left Sakiwayonge and started other villages. Most notably is Kikayonge, which is today Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then along the Wapashike Sapiwe, the Wabash River. Those weren't our only villages, but they're the ones that are most prominently known today. And as I say, we lived in these villages for, for centuries. And then in the 1600s, there were the Beaver Wars. And during that time, we fled west into what is Ohio, or excuse me, Illinois, and north into what is today Wisconsin. And after the Beaver Wars were over in the early 1700s, we returned to our homelands. We returned to these same village places, even though it had been 50 years. And, and most of the people who had been in those villages before probably were children when they left and now are older people when they return. But we knew where we came from and we returned to our same villages. While we were in Illinois and Wisconsin, we were trading with the French. And so when we came back to our villages in what is now Indiana, the French wanted to continue that trade as did we, uh, but we didn't want to continue it to the extent that we wanted to go where they wanted to trade. So they came to us. And so the French were trading with us near our villages where we had always been. And then by the mid, mid 1700s, we were also trading with the British. Now, after the American Revolutionary War, the Americans believed that this land was theirs. It happened this way. In 1763, there was a treaty of Paris and the French ceded their claims to this land to the British. Now, it was still our land. We hadn't given it, ceded it, traded it, sold it to the French. But they ceded their rights, which were from our perspective, trading rights and the rights to live where we allowed them to live. But those went to the British. And then of course, the Treaty of Paris, 1783, the end of the American Revolutionary War, that's when the British ceded the land to the Americans and they believed it was their land. And they started coming West and they came along, uh, up along the Ohio River, started crossing the Ohio River into Miamiange, into our land. We didn't want them there. You can imagine someone comes onto your land and they cut down your trees and they build houses on your land. You don't want them there. But of course, at that time, there were no laws to protect us. So the only way to get rid of them was to attack them. If we attack them, then they'll flee and, and they'll leave, right? No, they attacked us back. So pretty soon we have war. And there were a number of, of battles. Um, uh, Christine Thompson, I know you're out there and you could be talking about one of those battles as well as I could, the St. Clair's defeat. Um, but most of those battles, we were pretty successful. The Miami and and eight or nine other tribes along the way fighting together uh, were successful until 1794, the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And um, that was considered a defeat, but mostly we were tired of fighting. 
No matter how many battles we won, the Americans always had more men to fight and we didn't. And every time we had a battle, they burned our villages, they burned our cornfields, they burned our food stores, and we were starving the next winter. And so we decided the best thing to do was to go make peace. And so that was the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. I can make this. There we go. So in that treaty, in exchange for peace, we ceded most of what is today the state of Ohio, um, with some uh, parts in Indiana, uh, what's now downtown Chicago, downtown Detroit, but most of what we ceded was Ohio. But that was okay, because now they had their land. We had our land. We were going to be able to live together as neighbors in peace. But the Americans didn't stick to the treaty and they started coming into what is now Southern Indiana. And they started coming North. And the further North they came, the more land they wanted. And they wanted us to make more treaties and cede more land. So there were treaties in 1805, 1809, 1818, 1826, 1834, 1838. Now, by this time, we have ceded almost all of what is today Indiana, except for that white patch in the middle where Kokomo is today. We called it, it was called the Great Miami Reserve and it was about 500,000 acres. And that was all we had of, of communal land. Now we had individual Miami people who owned private property, had individual reserves. But this was the only communal land that we had as a tribe in Indiana. And so in two years, two years after this treaty, there's another treaty, the Treaty of 1840. Now, ever since the Treaty of 1826, the Americans were pressing us not just to cede land, but they wanted us to exchange our land for land west of the Mississippi River. And they wanted us to go to that land west of the Mississippi River and leave Indiana to them. Well, we kept saying, no, 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 we're not going. But they kept pressing. And in the Treaty of 1840, we agreed to exchange the Great Miami Reserve for land west of the Mississippi River. And we agreed to go to that land within five years. Now, no one wanted to go. Not even the men who signed the treaty wanted to go. So we kept putting it off. We can't go this year. We have to harvest our crops. We can't go this year. We haven't sold our private land yet. We can't leave our land behind, so we have to sell it before we can go. Every year we find reason to delay and to delay and to delay. Well, the five years come and go. And then in September of 1846, the US Army arrives at our villages and they round us up and take us to a prison camp in Peru, Indiana. Now, there were a few families, a few bands that uh, heard about the soldiers coming and they said, we're not going west. We are going north. Our friends and relatives in the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi up in Michigan, they will protect us. And that's where we're going. So the, the bands of Wawiasita, Pepekitcha, and the Pigeon family of Turtletown all fled north. But everyone else was rounded up at gunpoint and taken to Peru, to this prison camp. And then on October 6, 1846, 
They boarded us onto canal boats to take us from our homes. The canal boats were on the Wabash and Erie Canal. And so as we went east on the canal, we passed our homes, we passed our villages, we all passed our privately owned land, many of us knowing that we would never see our homes again. And then when we reached Ohio, we switched to the Miami and Erie Canal, which we took south to Cincinnati. And at Cincinnati, that was the end of the canals. And so then they put us on a steamboat on the Ohio River. It was the steamboat Colorado. This is a photograph that was taken of Cincinnati in 1848. So less than two years after we were there. So I imagine this is pretty much what Cincinnati looked like when we were there. Um, this is the public landing where we boarded uh, a steamboat that probably looked much like one of these boats. We came from the canals down Main Street, that's right here, and came to the public landing and boarded the boat. Now, every day in Cincinnati, the newspapers published the shipping news, uh, a list of all the items that had come into Cincinnati by boat and all the items that were leaving Cincinnati by boat. I'd like to share with you what the shipping news said the day that we arrived and left. Daily receipts by the Miami Canal, 134 barrels of whiskey, 218 barrels of flour, 10 sacks of 115 pounds of wool, eight barrels of varnish, two Indian ponies, Miami Indians, 225 over and 78 under eight years old, 49 perch stone, four pigs, and so on and so on. And shipments to St. Louis by the Colorado, 30 tons of dry goods, 32 casts of government store, 350 Indians with their baggage. It's very clear from these listings that we were not considered passengers on these boats. We were cargo. So we took the steamboat Colorado on the Ohio River and then up the Mississippi River to what is today St. Louis. But they didn't take us into St. Louis. They put us on a sandbar in the Mississippi River on the Illinois side that was called Bloody Island. Now, in the last two days before we arrived at Bloody Island, we had had two deaths. First, an infant, and then an elder man named Ottawa. And we buried them on Bloody Island at the edge of Miamionge. Now, the reason we stopped in St. Louis was that the steamboat Colorado didn't go any further than St. Louis. And we needed a smaller boat to go on the Missouri River, which is very shallow and rather treacherous. Treacherous. There have always been many shipwrecks on the Missouri River. So after three days, they finally found the Clermont Number no. 2, a smaller steamboat, and took us west on the Missouri River to the town of Kansas, what is today Kansas City, Missouri. And we stopped at the Kansas Landing. Now the reports for this part of the journey say that two thirds of us were sick while we were on the Clermont number two and four children died. From the town of Kansas, we went overland south about 50 miles to our new reservation. And there was one more death, a 16 year old boy. Now it was a hard winter. It's early November when we arrive. Seven had died on the journey and within two months after we arrived, at least 23 more died. So, at least 10% of the people who went on removal died as a result of the removal. 
One of those who died after we arrived at the new reservation was Shapakana, Thomas Godfrey. On December 24th, our chief, our principal chief, Tupia, Francis LaFontaine, wrote a letter to Alan Hamilton back in Fort Wayne. He wrote, Thomas Godfrey is very sick. His recovery is doubtful. We have another letter from January 31st, 1847, written by Seca Cueta, Thomas's mother. She wrote, I do assure you it is a pang to my heart. And what I feel so bad is that he died without my seeing him. She blamed Joseph Sinclair, the US removal agent. He had promised her that if she would let Thomas go, he would see that Thomas would come back when he himself came back. Because in fact, Thomas did not have to go on removal. There were a handful of families that were exempted from removal. And Seca Cueta's family, her husband's family, Palanzwa, Francois Godfrey, his descendants were exempted from removal. So Thomas didn't have to go, but he wanted to go. He was 16 years old and he wanted to go and protect his friends and his relatives who had to go. And so Seca Cueta trusted that Joseph Sinclair would see that her son came back after the removal trip. She said, it was under that promise that I consented to let him go, but God's will be done. I relied on him as a white man of honor and a father to us, but he belied me. Now, I think that Seca Cueta expresses the feelings of probably most Miami people at this time because everyone lost someone, whether it was to death or to separation of 600 miles, not knowing if they would ever see their friends and relatives again. So it was a hard winter. Um, but then spring came and we began building houses growing crops, we started businesses. We wanted to create a better life for our children. And life did get better. For quite a while, life was better there for, uh, for our families. But then the Americans came again. They were squatting on our land. The state of Kansas, Kansas was just becoming a state and didn't have money. And so they wanted to uh, take over our land and illeg illegally tax it. Now they couldn't do that, but we still had to go to court. We had to fight it in court. And then in the years leading up to the Civil War, there was bleeding Kansas. The Missouri bushwhackers were coming across the Missouri state line, which is right here into Kansas to bring slavery from the slave state of Missouri to the free state of Kansas. The only problem is when they're coming into what they call Kansas, they're coming right onto tribal reservations. This one's ours. These are all, these pastel pieces are all tribal reservations. So they're traveling through our land on their way to battle and our women, our women were still farmers. Farming was always women's work and our women were still our farmers, but now they're afraid to go into the cornfields, afraid those men might be coming along while they're out there alone. And they were afraid of what might happen to them. So after the Civil War, the US government wanted the Miami tribe and all of those tribes in Kansas to remove again this time to Indian territory in what is today Northeastern Oklahoma. And things had gotten so bad in Kansas that we agreed to go. And so our tribal government moved to Northeastern Oklahoma, to Ottawa County, 
where we share a reservation with the Peoria tribe. And that is where our tribe is today. Now, the results of these removals is that we are a divided people. Our population centers are northeastern Oklahoma, northern Indiana, eastern Kansas. But we have citizens all over the United States and in three other countries. And what happens when we're divided like that, where maybe it's just one family or a couple of families living and surrounded by people of another culture, whether it's um, uh, white America or whether it's another tribe with a different culture. You can see here are the Wyandotte, the Cherokee, the Osage, they all have very different cultures than Miami people do. So when we're surrounded by people of different cultures, we begin to adapt some of their ways. And pretty soon we assimilate to their culture and begin to lose our own culture. And that's what happened to us Miami people. We didn't lose our culture, but it went to sleep. Our culture and our language. Our last fluent native speakers of our language died in the 1960s. But then, in 1939, the Miami tribe reorganized under the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act as the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. That's when the of Oklahoma came into our name and we ratified our constitution in 1939. So today, the Miami tribe of Oklahoma is in the town of Miami, Oklahoma. That's our seat of government. We are a sovereign nation with a constitution. By that constitution, we elect our leaders. These are our current elected leaders. Um, we just had our elections a couple of weeks ago. We all went to Oklahoma and voted. And um, our, our secretary treasurer, Donya Williams, was up for election this year. And we unanimously acclaimed her um, to have another term. Um, this is our Chief Douglas Langford, our second chief, and our council people. Now, these people are our elected leaders, but we are governed by the general council. Those people over 18 who gather together to elect these people every year also tell them what we want them to do in the next year. And they're expected to do what the Miami people want. It is the Miami way to have servant leaders. Now, one of the things that we do to revitalize our culture, to relearn our language, is we come together, not just in a business meeting to elect our, our leaders and to tell them what we want them to do, we come together to bring back and to learn and to restore our culture and our cultural practices. One of the things that we like to do all year round when we get together is dance. Um, our favorite dance is called the stomp dance. Um, we dance around a fire, the men sing, and the women make the rhythm. If you can see, uh, these women have cans tied around their legs. Those cans have pebbles in them. And as they stomp, the pebbles shake. And that's the rhythm for the dance. And it's, it's a dance that we have, have um, danced for, for hundreds of years. And so um, we're happy to have it restored to us. When we get together in the winter time, we have storytelling. Many of our stories are winter stories, and that means that they can only be told in the winter. Starting in the fall, when the spring peepers, the frogs, stop croaking, 
and we have the first hard frost, then we can start telling stories. And then in the spring, when the spring peepers start croaking again, and we have the big thunder booms, then we lay aside the thread of storytelling until the next year. We are learning our language. We have an online dictionary, um, and it's not just the, the written words, but there are sound bites so we can hear how each word is supposed to sound. Um, we have, um, I believe, something like 91,000 words in the dictionary, and they've only begun to scratch the surface. Someone once said, there are only two or 300 words to the Miami language. That's all they need in their savage language, or in their savage life, excuse me. Well, we've proven that wrong. We have many, many thousands of words. It is a full-fledged language like any other language. And though our native speakers who were fluent have passed, we now have speakers who are learning to be fluent again, using the dictionary, using an online learning app. In the summer, we have camps in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and in Miami, Oklahoma. And we bring our children together to teach them the language, the culture, the history, teach them about the environment. And whatever we're teaching them, we're teaching them the language that belongs to that concept. But mostly what we are teaching them is how they are connected to each other as Miami people. They may live far apart. People drive quite a distance to bring their children to these camps. And the children may only see each other at camp and at the various gatherings that occur during the year. But they become friends and they become Miamiake, Miami people through these camps. We love to play games, not just at camp, but always, all year round, we love to play games. In fact, uh, a French trader named Nicolas Perrault um, in the late 1600s observed us playing, and he said they delight in their games. They so enjoy their games that they will forego eating and even sleeping to watch and play these games. I guess we weren't that different. That's how we are with games today. A lot, a lot especially young people, but some of us who are older too, we'll, we'll give up a lot so that we can play our games. Well, one of the games that we play and we're playing that Nicholas Pro actually commented on was Pekitaha Menge. It's lacrosse. Um, it was invented by the Iroquois, but spread from tribe to tribe pretty rapidly. And we have been playing lacrosse ever since. My colleague makes traditional style sticks. And so now we play with traditional sticks in the traditional way. We have one rule when we play lacrosse. Your hand cannot touch the ball. Otherwise, there are no rules. There are no boundaries. There are no rules about who can play or who can't play. Uh, our game a couple of weeks ago, we had our youngest player was five years old. Our oldest player was 83. Men and women, boys and girls, everyone plays and everyone has a good time. Other games that we have been playing since before the French saw us playing in the 1600s, um, Senza Wingi is uh, the dice game. It's a dice game and you toss the dice in the air in the bowl and how they fall, you get points. And moccasina game, that was originally played with moccasins instead of these pads, they were played with moccasins. That's a hide the pebble game. And so one team hides the pebble under the mat and the other team has to find the right pebble at the right time. And while the one team is trying to figure out where they hid that marble, the other team is singing 
to confuse them and distract them. And we play these games all year round whenever we come together. Unlike lacrosse, lacrosse can only be played in the summer, starting when the spring peepers start croaking. And we have the first big thunderstorm. We play lacrosse until the fall when the spring peepers stop croaking and we have the first hard frost. We lay down our lacrosse sticks and pick up the thread of storytelling. But these games, same Zawinga and Makasina, we can play those all year round, and we do. We have a sewing art called ribbon work. Now, ribbon work is common to most of the Great Lakes tribes, but Miami ribbon work is a little different in that all of our designs are made in diamond patterns. You can see this one has a couple of different diamond patterns to it. There's another pattern on the hat. This was an art that had almost fallen asleep, but has been revived. And though it would have generally been practiced by women, um, today it is, it is sewn by men and women and even, even some young people are learning to, who, young people who didn't know how to thread a, le a needle have learned how to sew ribbon work. Ribbon work is sewn uh, for us by taking silk ribbons, cutting them, folding them, and sewing them in layers to create these patterns. Now, ribbons were um, a new technology for Miami people. We had always used diamond patterns on tattoos, on um, painting painted hides. But when we got the silk ribbons, we found a way to use this new technology of silk ribbons to make new and different diamond patterns. Well, today we're taking these same patterns and using new technology. So we imprint ribbon work on our t-shirts. Uh, one person put it on the back of his cell phone case I use them on my PowerPoint slides. When you see these kinds of designs, you know you likely have a Miami person. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk uh, about my role as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. It comes out of the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106, and it provides that every federally recognized tribe may have a tribal historic preservation officer, or we say THIPO. Some say TIPO or THPO, we say THIPO. Um, but by this act, federal agencies must consider the effects of their projects that they approve or fund or carry out themselves or is on federal land. If there is any potential to affect historic properties, historic places, they have to consult with tribes. And if there is what is called an adverse effect, meaning it's not going to be good for that historic property, they have to consult with the tribes on how to avoid affecting that property or minimize the damage, or in the worst case scenarios, mitigate the effect. We try not to have, have to mitigate the effect um, of damaged historic properties, but sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's a question of protecting the lives of people today versus protecting an historic site. And that's when we go into to mitigation um, in, in some case like that, to how can we how can we at least preserve something of this? How can we preserve the memory of it? How can we preserve um, what happened? How can we tell the story that was here? So I, well, any tribal historic preservation officer must be invited to consult on federal undertakings in our tribal land, both our contemporary land, our ancestral homeland, any lands that we say 
are part of our, our history. And, will, and, and damage would affect our culture. So federal agencies all have to consult with us. And these are just a few of the federal agencies, probably the agencies that we most often uh, consult with. Um, what it comes down to is really, if there's going to be ground disturbance, if they're gonna be digging in the ground at all, then they need to talk to us. They need to talk to us if they do discover some, some archeological site. Um, whether they know that they're likely to, to encounter an archaeological site or whether it's totally unanticipated, and that happens. Um, and so we often enter into agreements with the federal agencies that in these cases, this is what we agree to. So we have programmatic agreements, we have memoranda of understanding, memoranda of, of agreement, um, and I won't go into details about what those are, but they're just basically different kinds of agreements. They sign, we sign, and we agree that it, in the case um, that something happens as outlined in that agreement, this is what we do. And it's a way of protecting um, both parties and most of all of protecting our historic sites. So why is it important to consult? Tribes often know about sites that no one else knows about, or we know about significance to the sites that no one else knows about. They might be the places where we live. They might be the places of cultural and historic importance to us. My job is not to stop projects, at least not most projects. And I can't single-handedly stop them anyway. But my job is to protect these historic and cultural resources. We use highways, we use cell phones, we use all of these things that need to be built. But we want them done in a way that doesn't have an impact on our history. And most projects aren't going to have an impact, and that's good. Now, this only applies to federally recognized tribes. Any interested organization can cons consult with the federal agency on a project, but not as a tribe. Federal recognition means that the United States recognizes the tribe as a sovereign nation. And that gives us the right to government to government consultation. Um, initially, they recognized us through treaties. Treaties only exist between sovereign nations. So by making a treaty with us, they recognized us as a sovereign nation. Today, there are other ways of, of recognizing tribes. It's problematic that it's left to the federal government to determine whether a tribe is a tribe, to recognize a tribe's sovereignty. But no one's come up with a good way to vet whether a group of people is really a tribe or not. States do not have a constitutional right to make treaties. They don't have a constitutional right to government to government consultation with tribes. Sometimes states do recognize groups, but honestly, they often don't vet them. It's a political move. And there are, we don't have any state recognized tribes in Indiana, but in states that do, in many cases, it's a political move and they're not a tribe. They're probably not, in many cases, not even native people. And unfortunately, there are many groups that claim to be native, to claim to be a tribe. They don't have the genealogy. They can't prove that they're native people. So why is this consultation important to tribes? Each of us has our own history. We have our own culture. We're talking about places where our ancestors lived, where they're buried, 
where their objects are buried? It's a question of respect for those ancestors, love and honor for those ancestors, respect for our tribal beliefs and practices. Even the objects that they're buried with are important to us. They were buried with someone, they were meant to stay with that person. There are also items of cultural patrimony. Sometimes these are not things that are buried in the ground, but things that were illegally taken from a tribe and now they're owned privately or sold uh, on the market and they have no right because they didn't belong to an individual. No individual had the right to sell them. They belong to the tribe and they need to go back to the tribe. Sometimes those are sacred objects, objects that are necessary for certain ceremonies to be performed. For tribes like the Miami tribe that have been forcibly removed from our ancestral homeland, our ancestors in Indiana are far from where the tribe is today. But we were in this homeland here in what is now Indiana for a far longer time than the existence of the United States. And our ancestors have become the dust of our homelands. So my work as tribal historic preservation officer is about our identity. It's about who we are as a people. It's about our way of life, our unique perspective. It's tied to our language, our story, our culture, our history. And probably most important, it's about leaving what we have learned behind for the next generations. Mission Newe. Thank you very much. Diane, that was wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Um, I want to be respectful of your time and see if there are any questions that folks would like to put in the chat. Uh, you did such an amazing job covering everything so thoroughly. Let's see, we do have a question. Uh, as a state official, is your jurisdiction limited to Oklahoma or do you consult with federal agencies on Indiana concerns as well? Good question. I am not actually a state official. There is a state historic preservation officer for each state, um, but I am a tribal uh, a, a appointment. Um, and so, yes, on our tri tribal reservation in Oklahoma, but I also consult in nine additional states, all those places where our ancestors lived or where we might find things that our ancestors left behind. Um, I consult. So um, I consult in all of Indiana, all of Illinois, Western Ohio, uh, most of Michigan, um, Kentucky along the Ohio River, Iowa along the, the Mississippi River, Wisconsin, um, southern Wisconsin, Missouri along the Mississippi River, and along the Missouri River where um, our removal was. Those four children who died on while we were on the Missouri River, we don't know where they were buried. So if, if for, by chance, by wonderful chance, they were ever... Uh, discovered, um, we would want to take care of them. So I consulted, and, and of course, Kansas, because we were in Kansas um, for a period of time. So um, those two can just the two counties in Kansas where, where our reservation was. Thank you, Diane. Um, we've had a couple questions about the recording. So again, I just wanted to let everyone know that I will be uh, sending it out by email, but also we will be posting it to ILPA's 
um, YouTube channel as well. So I will make sure that that recording uh, gets out to everyone. Um, are there any more questions for Diane? Okay, we have Sarah asking, what relationship do you have with other tribes that had Ohio as homeland? So we have had a relationship with those tribes for a long time. They were our neighbors um, for centuries um, in some cases. They are, most of those tribes are um, uh, of the Algonquian language family. So we have a, a, a language root. We don't speak the same language, but some of those languages are mutually intelligible or easily um, understandable. Think Italian and French. They have the, uh, they're part of a language family and, and, the, and you can see the commonality between them. So many of the, uh, the like the Potawatomi and the Ojibwe and the Ottawa and the Shawnee and the Delaware, um, we, we share a common language root. Um, we look at relationships in terms of family terms. So the Delaware are our grandfathers. The Shawnee are our elder brothers. The Wyandotte are our uncles. They're not Algonquian. They're not a part of our language family, but we had relationships with them. So they're an uncle, not a direct line. Um, and the Peoria people um, who share a common language and a common culture with us, um, we see as our younger siblings. Um, so we, we have often um, allied with each other um, when, with a common need. Sometimes we're, we were fighting against each other, but, but often we were allied uh, together. Thank you, Diane. Uh, we do have another question from Chandra. Uh, Chandra is asking, what is the Miami tribe of Oklahoma's relationship to the uh, Miami uh, Nation of Indiana? So the Miami Nation of Indiana is the Miami Nation of Indiana, Indians of Indiana, Inc. They are a 501c3 organization. They are um, Miami people. They are our relatives. Um, and they all could enroll in the Miami tribe of Oklahoma if they chose. Some people choose to enroll in the tribe and some do not. There was a period, um, especially that period from 1939, our 1939 constitution did not allow anyone other than those in Oklahoma to um, enroll in the tribe. And so during that period, there was no opportunity, and even before that, uh, no opportunity for Indiana Miamis to be part of a federally recognized tribe. But in 1996, the tribe voted to change our enrollment requirements, and now virtually every person who is a Miami descendant can enroll in the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and be part of a federally recognized tribe. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of really good questions uh, just came up. Uh, one, are Sierra Club outings and leaders, and I think this is a question that uh, multiple organizations have asked, um, but this group is asking, what is the most respectful way to acknowledge land on which we are hiking? Um, so we'll start with that, Diane. Could you uh, provide any guidance or advice on that? If you're just out hiking, just if it's just an uh, you're talking about an individual or a small group of people, um, yeah, just remember, remember that we are not the first people to be on this land. That this land has has people who have been here for maybe seventeen thousand years. That people have lived on this land, and that the land still exists in part because of the way those people interacted with the land and to be, to be thankful and to be grateful to them. If you are an organization, however, I suggest you think about taking um, greater steps. How can you um, engage with federally recognized tribes um, that have uh, historic ties to the area where, where your organization is located? And, uh, that might be 
um, talking, most of all, talking to them, um, but learning about them. What is their history? What is, is um, important that we know about them? Um, I, I'm sure you're maybe thinking about land acknowledgements and those are fine, but if they are only what they are, if it's just a statement that this was your land, but now it's ours, essentially, that's not respectful. Um, but if it says this was your land and we want to take action to work with the peoples whose land this has been, it, it needs to be an action statement rather than just a statement of who, who owned the land when. I think that's a really, really great point, Diane. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I know we've we've discussed that as well. And I, I like the way you um, discuss it in terms of an action statement. Um, I think that's important for all of us to think about. Um, the second question is uh, that was asked is how can we best support first peoples in Indiana? As I, as I said, learn about us, talk to us, go to, go to our websites to find out what we say about ourselves, learn about our history, and be aware that you probably know Native people, probably people who are enrolled in federally recognized tribes you may know, and you don't, you don't even know that they are. Um, and just be aware that that we are not we are not just a race of people. We are citizens of sovereign nations, and we have treaty rights, and we have rights because we've been here since time immemorial. And so, being aware of when you're taking action, what what does this say about or to native people? And what can we learn about those native people? And in some cases there are, are uh, published information, um, in other cases, not so much. Um, on, on this page, this last link here, I, I think that Andrea put that on the, um, in the notes as well, but this achimotatiyangwe.org, which is really hard <laughs> to um, copy. So you might wanna cut and paste it from the, the um, chat notes there, um, but it's a blog, it's a community blog and has a lot of stories, a lot of our history in that blog. And it's a good way to learn about the Miami tribe of Oklahoma um, and other tribes have other kinds of, of information sources. Um, Diane, I. I have uh, just a quick question. I was wondering, you know, we have had um, organizations that have asked, I, I know that the tribe gets many requests to uh, partner on different projects. What, could you give us an example of a good partnership or, or project or what, what is a meaningful partnership from your perspective? So on this, this, um, uh, in, in the audience here, I guess, as you want to call it, is Christine Thompson of Ball State University. And the Miami tribe, the Eastern Shawnee tribe, the Ottawa tribe, a number of tribes who, for whom this is a, our ancestral homeland, have been working with Christine and her colleagues at Ball State University since, I think, 2018, um, developing a traveling exhibit. Um, and Christine might just jump in here to, to, to um, help with the story, but they came to Oklahoma to talk to us and they had a, held a meeting with us and, and to talk with us about this project that they were going to do for this traveling exhibit. Um, happened to be on St. Clair's defeat. Um, and they asked a question to start and for the next hour and a half, all the tribes were telling them all of this is why this is, and that's, and this is, and 
they had this wonderful PowerPoint presentation, which they just threw out the window. And after about an hour and a half, somebody said, oh, what kind of ruined your presentation? And they, and they said, no, this is what we needed. We didn't know what we needed. This is what we needed. We listen to you and we hear what we need to, to do. Um, and, and so that's, that has been my, one of my primary examples of, of a good relationship. Um, a similar relationship is with the Indiana Dunes. We work with the uh, Porter County Visitor Center and the, the National Park um, on uh, an ethnobotany trail and on other kinds of projects there in, in at Indiana Dunes. And again, we've been working with them since I think 2017, 2018, and it's an ongoing relationship. Um, something that helps because tribes, um, Many of the tribes, especially the ones in Oklahoma, um, we don't have unlimited funds. And so, um, you know, if you ha have a grant, build into the grant um, stipends uh, and travel money for, for the tribal partners. Um, find ways to, to help make it possible for those tribal partners to participate without um, making it a, a, a great burden on them. Those are great examples. Thank you so much. Um, we do have uh, one more question and then I'll take final questions just so we can uh, get you going. But uh, the next question that came in, since your culture lives on in the language, should we make an effort to revert original names of areas here? We don't usually ask that names be changed. Sometimes we do. Um, you may be aware that, that several years ago now, uh, Secretary of, of the Interior, Deb Holland, um, called for all place names that included the SQ word um, to be changed because it's an offensive word to Native people. And so uh, we've worked with a number of agencies, including the uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there's the US has actually a board of geographic names, I think it's what it's called, something like that. Um, and so we've we've worked with them and with um like the National Forest, they they have looked at, at changing um names. So we don't seek it out, but if there's a particular place that people feel like this is not an appropriate name, um we we're happy to work with you and, and talk about it. it may or may not be appropriate to use the original name um sometimes the current name it comes from our name for example the wabash river um comes from our our name for it, the wapashike sapiwe so you know it's it's comes from how the french tried to pronounce our word um, which then comes into english um and in other cases, it's been it's been what it's it is for so long. And if you tried to to put in the Miami word, nobody would be able to pronounce it, um, at least not by looking at the spelling. And so we're we're very conscious of of that kind of thing. We want people to to be able to pronounce the name of places. So um, if if there's a particular name that you think ought to be changed, uh, talk to the tribes um, who who have ancestry in that area. And I will uh, repeat that, that all of Indiana is, is um, uh, part of our ancestral homeland, the Miami tribe, um, but a lot of it was shared territory with these other tribes as well. Um, but just talk to them and see, see um, uh, if somehow together you can come up with a, a, a more appropriate name. Thank you so much. Are there any final questions for Diane? Diane, would it be all right if I include your contact information when I send out the recording? Yes, that's fine. Thank you so much. Um, again, just to let everybody know, it might take a couple of days to get the recording up, but Diane, this has been so informative and thought-provoking and wonderful, and we can't thank you enough for your time and for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed talking with you and really good questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon and thank you again, Diane.